I'm Tori Bailey, I'm the Executive Director of the Theater Development Fund in New York City, and we'll explain in a minute how, how and why we're here. Um, but first, I want to extend a huge thanks to Lloyd for hosting us, um, to Howard and Jeff and their team, who really have been great. Um, this is the first stop in a series of conversations. Um, I think it's, it's really appropriate that we got to do it first at Lloyd, where it's about a lot of stuff that's new, and it's okay to be a little messy. So anyway, here we all are. Um, this project uh, really has grown out of a series of, of pieces of work and conversations that both TDF and Theater Bay Area have been having for a number of years. Some of you probably know TDF. We did a piece of research a few years ago about uh, the production of New American Plays, and that led to um, the report that ended up being the book, which was Outrageous Fortune. And a lot of Outrageous Fortune had to do with issues around the lives of playwrights that weren't specifically on mission for TDF. TDF is an organization that is committed to building and developing audiences. But one of the pieces in that research um, that we kept hearing about in conversations was were issues that revolved around playwrights and theaters in their conversations about marketing and building audiences and figuring out who was coming to the theater. And so there was a piece of that that seemed worth probing further to those of us at TDF related to what we're supposed to do. Like, similarly, um, Theater Bay Area was involved in a piece of research. Right, which some of you might know about, and, and Clay Lord, who's with us today, he used to be with Theater Bay Area, now he's with American City Arts, um, was very active in, we commissioned um, research that we did around the country, um, actually in two different rounds, but the first round was in six cities, um, 18 theaters, looking at the intrinsic impact of the theater experience on the audience. So what is intrinsic impact? In case we didn't come to the town meeting that we had here a couple of years ago, it is that deeply felt experience by the individual person who is engaging with a piece of art. It doesn't matter theater, it could be something, but we were looking at theater. Um, and audiences engage with a piece of theater in many different ways and are impacted in different ways, emotionally, intellectually, um, socially, ways that you're growing maybe aesthetically, and we, and working with Alan Brown, we've discovered ways to both um, interrogate people about that, and they're eager to tell you about it, to tell you the truth, and then to actually plot, plot that and, and measure it and put it in charts and graphs. And really the point of it was not just to find out some wonky data, but really to help theater makers and, and both the artists and, the, and the, the companies find ways to deepen and lengthen that impact. And so, really, really interesting findings came out of that and from our subsequent research. So, um, Tori and I were at, um, there was a convening here at, at, arena. Convening at the arena a couple of years ago, um, and it was looking at um, new work and new work development around the country, um, and there were a number of really amazing conversations there, but one of the things that we realized while we were there is that we were talking a lot about the relationship between the artist and the company, but we were including this idea of what about the relationship between an artist, a company, and the ultimate recipient of the work, the audience, and why, and we were never having audiences actually in the conversation. And that was part of where this The last afternoon of that conference, there was a series of like circle conversations, and there were a couple of artists who said, why do we always talk about the audience and we never put them in the conversation? So really, um, we had want, we wanted to look at a kind of three-way conversation, where is the audience, where is the artist or the generative artist, and where is the theater, and we got funding from the Doris Duke Cheryl Trust, whom we all give thanks and to, for making this possible, and then we've done some research, and if you had any time, you may have looked at um, some of what of what we sent out. Um, we also um, owe a thank you to Stephen Wolf and South Coast Rep, because they allowed Alan to use a bunch of work from work that they had commissioned at their theaters. So this is step one. We've got this research, and it's got some findings, and we're really interested in people's responses to it. We're, this is the first of six cities we'll be here. We're going to Chicago, Minneapolis, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York. Um, and after those conversations, our hope is that over the summer into the fall, we'll have information to be able to go back and survey audiences more directly what resonates, what doesn't, what do we need to be asking them, and then it's pointing towards a, a larger conversation in Boston next winter, HowlRound is another partner on this project. And so what we did is this morning, um, Wooly helped curate, we, we, did a, we put a group together of folks from very diverse organizations, which the, 
we're going to talk about in a minute, to try and unpack what was a lot of material and figure out what were four or five things out of all of that that resonated for the group. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then you know they'll share some perceptions. And then we're going to turn it wide open. So we're going to do a little bit of talking. Not us, but our colleagues, whom I want to thank. A little bit of talking. And then we'll, we'll turn it over. And we'll have a, a larger conversation. Okay. And before we, before we do that, we yeah. wanted to just get a little bit of sense in the room. Because this morning, when there were fewer people, we were actually able to go around and introduce ourselves. And, might take up most of the afternoon, but <laughs> wanted to get just a little bit of a sense, and please feel free to raise your hand for every single thing for which you might self-identify, okay? <laughs> so just, because, like, I knew that you are not my peeps, my peeps are on, you know, the Bay Area, so, like, I don't know you by just looking at you. Um, who in the room would identify as a playwright or a generative artist? Okay? Who in the room would identify as a theater administrator? It might be the same people. Who in the room would works with or for a large institution, theater institution? And who for a small, again, could be people working with theater institutions, right? Thank you. And who in the room would identify or has ever been or ever will be an audience member? <laughs> ah, okay. So that just sort of helps set the context for the ways that we are going to be coming at and the perspective that you might be bringing to the conversation. Now, Mark, okay. Yes, yeah, so. Um, Introduce yourself. Yes, before we get started with the big piece where we ask all of you to talk to us, we're going to quickly uh, just give you some of the big, most exciting talking points that came from what happened this morning. And my name is Mark Blankenship. I am TDS editor of online content, which at the moment means uh, theater and dance magazine, as well as two film projects. It's neither here nor there for today, but there you go. Um, <clears throat> And joining me also are a group of four artists who uh, were passionately involved in the conversation this morning. I'll allow you to briefly introduce yourselves. Uh, Woody and Sullivan, I'm a playwright, theater commentator, co-founder of The Welders, and product director at the National New Play Network. I'm Adrienne Alice Hansel. I'm the literary director at the Studio Theater, so um, have a hand in audience engagement, have a hand in programming. My name is Anu Yadav. I'm a playwright and I'm Ronnie Pinoy. Uh, I'm an independent producer. Uh, my uh, creative organization is called Theater from the District, and I'm working with Anna Yuda, Vanishing Productions, Dog of Pony DC, and Transit Lounge. And I'm just going to quickly vamp as I run over here to do one thing. And come back over here. <laughs> yes, it's a time piece, it's very valuable. So, first, Ronnie, if you would uh, just uh, talk a little bit about the scope of our conversation from this morning. Yeah, so one of the, the first things that we talked about this morning was trying to get uh, our, our, our hands around the kind of inclusivity factor of the, the conversation. So the, uh, one of the papers you know, really created this, this triangle of uh, audience, theater, and artist. So we wanted to really embrace the fact that sometimes the theater and the um, artist can be one and the same, especially in the case of smaller organizations, in the cases of you know, ensembles. It can actually be less of a triangle and more of a direct correlation. So that was that was one way. Um, and also, the uh, one of the articles really there was a kind of an arrow of you know here is our new work audience, and we're kind of bringing them from one end of this spectrum to the other. So we were thinking a lot about that and realizing that a lot of this conversation is not only about the audience that is in the room, but the audience that is not inside of this room. So that when we're talking about audience here, we're not just talking about audience for new work. We're not talking about the audience that is currently going and just not happening to come to this particular show, but the audience that is not yet a, a theater audience. And we're thinking about them too and embracing them in that conversation as well. Um, and the the kind of the third way that we wanted to make sure that we defined the scope of it was in um, inclusivity in terms of in terms of diversity, making sure that we acknowledge that you know of all of the you know millions of people. In this country, there is this narrow, you know, sector that is currently coming to the theater, um, and we acknowledge and you know want to make sure that we're thinking about those that are, are not coming. You know, those that are making sure this will come up later. Um, we want to make sure we're giving them a, a, an invitation to the work. So really, that um, rather than get locked into the notion of the institution is here hiring the artist and here is the audience, that we're open to and thinking largely about the, the universe of work. And companies and independent artists who are making work and engaging with the audience in ways that are different from that triangle as well. So don't feel like, you know, uh, as you're kind of thinking about that, that you're locked out of the conversation because you're not an institution or, you know, a 
who are getting hired by an institution. Um, so I'll get there. Great. So again, what's going to happen is we're just going to touch on the three big topics, and then we'll ask you to respond to all of them at the end. That way, none of the topics will get short shrift. And I just want to interject, which I forgot to do earlier, that a lot of the reading or the survey stuff with conversations about risk and where your audience is and their appetite for it, part of what we figured out this morning as we started talking about risk and risk tolerance was, you know, if we're talking about new plays, or we're talking about plays that are not new but are being done in a different fashion, right? It can be, it's a whole host of things, it's not just new. It can be risky in that it's a, it's a new way of looking at stuff. These were topics that grew out of a conversation <coughs> and the statistics about, you know, this conversation about how do you move people along the continuum? How do you make people become more actively engaged in the work? And it very quickly moved to it's not just this, as Ronnie said, not just the people in the building, it's the people who aren't even coming in. And so this is, this was kind of what emerged out of a set of kind of statistical work and kind of, so from risk came this. So, uh, Gwydion, would you talk to us a little bit about the triangle? The triangle. <laughs> so, you know, we talked about this uh, three-corner triangle of artist, audience, and institution, and as we started to examine it, we realized that, uh, you know, for a lot of us, that triangle looks like this, and the point at the top is the institution, and the institution is mediating a relationship between artists and audience. Uh, you know, we select these artists to perform within the wall of our institution, and we invite this audience to come in there, and the only engagement between artists and audience is culturally mediated by an institution. And what we what we uh, started to get to is that we're feeling like there's a culture shift where that triangle is inverting. And the institutions of the present day are, are embracing a, a second way of existing in which they serve as more of a platform at the bottom, holding up and facilitating rather than mediating a relationship between artist and audience. They are doing what they can to actually shrink the distance between artist and audience, and between art and audience, so that those things are more proximal, more immediate, more relevant, more meaningful, and more impactful, both for the artist and, in fact, for the audience. So um, that was one broad theme that emerged for us this morning. Uh, Adrian Alice, would you like to talk about the two audience models that we discussed? Sure. Uh, <laughs> so this might take a slightly longer to break down. But one of, as we were talking through audiences, who are in the room, audiences who are in the room, work that we do um, as artists, as administrators, um, as fellow audience members, cajoling people to come to the theater, um, there, it, it, it emerged that we were talking about two separate ideas of an audience. And one is, what we call this, what we've decided to call our sustained audience. So those are sort of habitual theater goers. Um, they might be subscribers. They might just, they might just be frequent offenders um, around a number of theaters. But they're people in the habit of going to the theater. Um, and then there's what we call event or play specific audiences. So that says we have this play. It has this content. We think it has resonance with a particular set of people or. A bunch of different kinds of people, and we're going to gather them together to give, you know, occasion to buy this play. Um, and a couple things that came up in thinking about the balance between play-specific and sustained audiences. Um, one is the question of where the sort of generative artist is in conversation with an institution about finding that audience, cultivating that audience. Um, we may call out um, Karen Zacharias, who is somewhere in this room, but I. Uh, is right there. Uh, was a, a, a really interesting, wonderful story about um, working at the Denver Center um, and discovering that, in fact, she had great information about uh, the particulars <coughs> of a uh, potential audience for, um, for a play of hers um, that actually the institution didn't seem to have. Um, and, and, and that story has a happy ending. Um, <laughs> but it, but, it, took, it, but it, it took that cast and, and that writer to say, I think there might be an audience for this that will actually enrich everyone's experience. And so that was another piece of what we talked about, is thinking about how having an audience that might have a particular connection to a play, get the inside jokes, um, or just a, who, who might, for whom that play might be specifically resonant, actually affects the whole audience's experience, so affects your sustained audience as, as well. Um, and, one, and then one of the questions that I think we, we leave open and that we discussed is how different stakeholders might balance the ideal mix of an event-specific audience and a, a sustained audience. An artist might think, I want people who just want to come to my play. For instance, 
They might not think that. Uh, and institution might think, it's great to have those, those play-specific audience members, but I, I need my sustained audience. Um, and artists, you know, artists may be all over the place, and audiences may be all over the place. If you're someone who's very used to going to the theater, you may not want to sit next to someone for whom this is their first or second play. Or likewise, if you are someone who's for whom this is a first or second play, you may either feel more comfortable or less comfortable sitting next to someone who uh, has clearly done this many times before. So that, that was the nature of that conversation of the two audiences. Great. And would you like to talk to us about the invitation? Yeah, yeah. Please do. So, yeah, we talked about the invitation, uh, the idea of who are we as uh, theater makers, administrators, all the people involved in this, who are we inviting <coughs> to the theater? Who's actually, uh, who is, and versus who's actually being invited? Um, and this idea of um, what, what's the purpose of why we're reaching out to different communities? Uh, what do we want to see in the audience? What's our purpose there? Do we see them as, are, are they consumers or clients? Are we a part of building uh, the community and engaging with the community as a part of like a, a civic, you know, institution of sorts? Um, and this idea, jumping on the idea that this diversity, <coughs> however you choose to define that, can make the experience richer for everybody. Um, and one example, in addition to the example of um, Karen's play, which you should talk about, um, is uh, with, with Forum Theater um, uh, produced uh, my play, Mina's Dream, which I also performed in, and we uh, decided to engage in some of the community organizing um, principles that I had some experience in prior to, and so we uh, organized a street team of passionate volunteers who were excited about the themes in the work, because they had been at a reading and had connected to it personally. Um, it's about healthcare and having it and not having it and done it in a fantastical way. And um, so they just went out, we made an Excel spreadsheet. Who are the groups that <coughs> connect to this? Where are they? What are the contacts? And you're gonna reach out to these groups. You're gonna reach, who are you comfortable reaching out to? What, what are your strengths as a volunteer? What do you wanna do? What excites you? Do that, and so we um, did that, and, and reached out to a broad uh, base of people, and um, that helped who was in the room, and then it helped the post-show discussions <coughs> after, because you have a broad swath, broader swath of people from different socioeconomic. You know, it, it increases the IQ of the audience. Um, you have more. Um, it's just richer. It's more interesting. So that was exciting, and um, in talking about the invitation and um, extending them, really extending them. So just to, to summarize <clears throat> one more time before we open the floor, in the sense of discussing the idea of investigating and honoring an audience's sense of risk and curiosity about work, we are currently very interested in the question of who and who is being invited and how are they being invited. How does that relate to their sense of risk and curiosity? And when we are inviting them, what type of audience are they? Are they a sustained audience, or are they a <laughs> event or play-specific audience? And at the end of the day, what kind of uh, organizational structure has been created that allows those invitations to those various audiences to have the most impact with regard to these general audiences' sense of risk and curiosity? So. With that, I now pass it back down this way, and um, you guys can facilitate. Well, and, and just, I don't know if you guys want to talk for a few minutes about a couple of these things, and then to just, what, what is the, the triangulation, for instance? We talked some amongst ourselves about the freedom that that really didn't open up, and about evening that out. You want to unpack that a little bit, you guys? I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things we were talking just to say one of the things we were talking about was um, was also sort of I mean, as Ronnie was saying before, honoring that not all uh, or not all institutions see themselves as made up of anything other than artists. That they're, you know, that in, I guess that's exactly what you're saying. Is that you know, in thinking about this triangle, you know, if it's actually you know where the institution and where the artists, you know, the audience, it's actually it's a very different. It's a, that that I think is very specifically like the image of flattening out. Mm -hmm. um, had something to do with it. Yeah, we talked about like the Wellers, you know, 
and we'll, the artists are the administrators. And we, we talked about um, uh, this not being a pejorative way to imagine no. an institution either, right? This is this is the model that we've inherited, and it's it's it, institutions have become storehouses of cultural knowledge, and they keepers of the flame in a lot of ways, and they've, they've served us proudly. I think we're talking about enhancing that model with this model. We're talking about institutions learning to flexibly work, <coughs> so that they, they both mediate exchanges between artists and audiences, but also facilitate them as well, and sort of learn new ways to be in relationship, you know, for their brands to, to be in relationship to the work they're producing. Yeah. And, and, yeah. But just to jump uh, in on that a little bit, mm -hmm. we, we were also talking about the, the different ways that large and small organizations uh, work in, in inviting audiences to their shows. So with, and the word stakeholder got used actually in two very interesting ways. So with um, some smaller organizations or ones that are structured differently, this, we realized that you know, this idea of artist as stakeholder um, became very important. You know, with a company like you know, Dog and Pony DC, that sense of personal investment of going out into the community and doing that work of reaching out to people to come to, to your show is very different than, well, not very different, but it's, it's a different kind of engagement than the kind of way that Wooly uses the term stakeholder uh, with the connectivity initiative of finding stakeholders in the community. Who are the tastemakers? Who, you know, is the designed audience that's going to, you know, kind of complete this conversation? So the way that the artist is stakeholders and is, is important and the way that you find stakeholders in the community is important. And there are two different ways of getting at the same thing, and a lot of times organizational scale becomes a part of that. So we're really interested in other things that people are doing in terms of this, you know, what is, does this triangle resonate for you? How are you? Because a big part of this work is bright spots. A big is what Polly call, calls bright spots. Things that folks are doing that are working to help. You know, what do you think? Is is the theater the mediator? Is it more this way? Does this ring true? Does this all seem stupid? Does any of this make sense? <laughs> Thoughts? Anybody? You were talking a lot. Yes. Sure. I um, I guess I was struck in the reading and in your conversation about if it's a triangle, we seem to be focusing the risk of tolerance on the audience an awful lot. Mm -hmm. And it's straight, really, it's an ecology of risk, yeah. that everybody in that network is taking a risk, financial cred credibility, right. personal time, money, right. um, uh, all this sort of stuff. And I wonder if it's really about convincing one point in the triangle to, to be more risk tolerant, or if it's about finding a way for the whole system mm -hmm. to understand and mediate risk in more mm -hmm. effective ways. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, what I said? Yes, yeah. it does. It does. <laughs> I mean, those of you who are, are running bigger, small organizations, what are, I mean, where, where is your feeling about your audience, right? Who's, whose job is it to figure out who's sitting there? And what's scary about doing that? Yeah. Uh, I think this is answering your question. My apologize if it's not. That's OK. Uh, so for me, uh, the first thing that I think of is I hate the word audience. Mm -hmm. Like, I hate it. It's a super technical term that doesn't mean what I think it should mean. I, why don't we build fans? I'm a fan of wrestling, and I'm a fan of comic books, and because I'm a fan of that, I buy t-shirts and I support them, and I spend money on not only the creators, but also the product, and I feel like I'm a part of the industry, even though I'm not an active participant in it. And we talk mm -hmm. about the audience in this technical and distant ways, and mm -hmm. why don't we start creating a fan base, and people who have a demand for our work is either institutions or audiences so that we don't have to ask permission all the time to try and figure out what the risk is instead build up people who have an excitement and want to see us and support us because they actually want to buy our t-shirts and they want to put our brand on their bodies because they're into it. I see it happen in almost every other industry but we keep a giant distance in terms of wanting to just talk about people who are fans of us and our work and putting our hearts forward and saying our company like has this actor and this actor, so they're awesome. We're going to publicize them front and center for everything and build up a little bit of a mini celebrity culture around the fact that for my company, Aaron Live is amazing at music. If you're doing music at all three of these shows, you should check them out, just like I buy that. And you do that? Yeah, we're and trying to work? more and more. I, you know, we're young, and this is something that I've only become obsessed with in the last like six months, so I can't <laughs> tell you 100%, but I think so. People know us as the company that says be awesome a lot, so that's something more than I think other companies maybe have sometimes, but uh, and it's just a matter, like I see it in all the other arts that I participate in, and it just really frustrates me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other 
Other thoughts? That, yeah. Um, I think there's something to be said about um, creating, uh, sort of building on that sort of fan idea, but sort of creating an experience for people. So um, there's an experiential sort of miss to the visit to see something, um, whether that's free popcorn, a beer, or whether that's some interactivity in the lobby. Uh, just, and I don't think it's all about immersive theaters and film wars, which I think is a is a huge trend, and I think it's something to sort of engage in, even if it's simply sort of state to stage something in a cafe or a bar that sort of takes the wall down a little bit and creates a little bit more of a connectivity between the audience. Um, I know it's you can't do that with every show, but I think that I see a trend in many theaters doing that kind of thing. Trying to sort of get, I mean, it starts as simply as the yes, you can take your Sunday into the theater, which. <laughs> Four or five years ago, there were a couple theaters doing that, and now it's kind of widespread, and people have sort of, sort of put away the whole cleanup mess on the floor thing and tried to sort of open up the experience people are that are not regular theater goers are having elsewhere with sporting events and film, and trying to sort of make it a more comfortable, uh, uh, familiar atmosphere to sort of take some of that risk out of what am I doing here if I've not been there before. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's also important to recognize that not all audience members participate in the same way. That some people are fans, and some people are interactive, and some people just want to sit back and experience a play and participate the way they participated for the past 50 years of their life. Um, so when we talk about these relationships, it's not just about building a single way of connecting or explaining the work that we're doing or connecting the artist to the audience, but creating a dynamic system that can be used by people who have different needs. And what role do you, do you both, do we see different, you know, just the thought about, you know, where where does the artist live in the conversation about the drinks in the theater? And I mean, I know artists go crazy about that stuff because that's not, you know, they feel like they've created work and it needs to be said. And so where's the conversation between the theater, whatever it is, and the artist who says, wait a minute, you know, this is not a picnic, this is, right? And then, right, so I'm curious what people think about that and how do you put all those people together and what is that conversation? Thoughts about that? People are nodding their heads. Well, a lot, a lot of it's about starting it from the beginning of the evening to the end, too. You need to think about everything from the dining experience, the shopping, the parking, you know, a dirty bathroom, you know. But do you then pull it back during the playwright when you have that? I mean, I'm just curious. I, I, think, judgment is. I think some of it is if it's the food relation, the food and theater thing, because I think that does sort of affect a very somber tone piece that you don't want candy wrappers and things like that, and you want to sort of have the right vibe versus a comedy where it's kind of like a free for all almost, where it doesn't matter. But um, I think that's about the institution sort of cultivating the audience experience. Uh, from buying a ticket on so that they can sort of help that be a better experience from arrival and making that comfortable and getting in the building and then sort of enjoying the space as well as the show and the staff and all that. I had a, I had a, I was wondering, yeah. would this be a moment that, would you be up for sharing a bit of your experience, Karen, with the, oh, oh, oh <laughs> and I'm putting you on the spot. You don't have to answer now. Oh, just what happened? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, yeah, it's about right. audience and audiences and how they, yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Karen Sakaias <laughs> Playwright. I just had a, a play at the Denver Center that was based on a policy book about immigration. And um, yes, anyway, so uh, uh, it, it seemed a little bit unadaptable at the time, but the theater really felt that this was a civic issue that they needed to talk about with their constituents. And I, I did a, 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 a reading, and then after the reading, two things happened that I'd never heard before. One was the artistic director and slash director said, I need more actors in this. And the second one is, um, immigration is moving so quickly on the floor, we're going to push the play, we're going to do it eight months sooner than we expected it to. So that was, I had never heard that before. <laughs> that was, the other thing that happened was they were putting it in their main stage, 800 seat theater, um, where they usually do Shakespeare's and classics, a brand new play about immigration. And um, they, of course, wanted to sell tickets. And what was becoming clear is that they really wanted a diverse <coughs> Mexican or immigrant population to come in. But um, they were doing both ways of marketing. And suddenly the actors and I, we all went in and talked to both Kent and the marketing department, saying, this, you will not get a 
diverse population would come in doing the things in the old way. Um, you need to have us be ambassadors. We need to speak on the Spanish-speaking um, news. Uh, we need to have things in Spanish. We need to have a code that people have so they can get reduced price tickets because it's better to fill up every seat with a lot of people than have uh, you know, really expensive seats and have the, the half audience full. Because having a diverse audience will actually improve the experience for everybody. And they did it. I mean, towards the end, we had sold out performances with the largest Latino population, plus a lot of the immigrant population that wasn't Latino because the play corresponded to them. But it, it was a really interesting experiment where the old ways of marketing weren't working, but it really took the artists talking directly to the staff and about why the play was important. It was like, it, was, it isn't about being an immigrant, it's about being an American. What is being an American these days? And I don't know what that means for their marketing later on and for return, um, return customers, and I'm going to Denver tomorrow, so I can ask. But it really was an eye-opening, it really was about really having a dialogue with the audience and the audience changing because of it. And, and one of the things, and I'm curious what people think, was that was in Zani's work, that where we, she looked at what did the theaters think and what did the, the playwrights think. Um, one of the questions was about how, how adept is the marketing department at creating excitement and engagement about new work. And the theaters all felt pretty good about that. And the playwrights all thought that the theaters were doing a really not so successful job about that. It was pretty big, broad. And, and I'm curious what people's thoughts are about why that dichotomy of opinion exists. And there was some conversation this morning about the pressure that marketing folks are under to do what they know as opposed to try stuff that might. So I'm curious to hear about people's experiences either as the theaters with with the artists and audiences and marketing tech, or for the playwrights in the room, the extent to which you had the experience that Karen took ownership of and went in with her actors and said, this is, if you want to get that churn in the house, this is what you're going to have to do. So other experiences with that? Yeah. Well, I'm currently acting in um, a play, Yellow Face for Dead Women and Rock Theater Day, and I was so impressed that I chose to do that. I was kind of curious how they were going to market it. And as you said, it's kind of the job of not only the regular media outlets, but also the voices that you kind of just have to help with that. Um, but I, 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 wondered, I wondered how established theater that had their own subscriber base, how they were going to grow that audience. And, um, and I just talk about risk and, and how, how risk embracing an audience is. I feel like there's a direct correlation between ticket price <laughs> kind of going in with your club, but like you said, you have to have some reduced ticket, you know, and, um, you know, the Force Collision, we did something in the article yards, we were out in the and there were, there were free tickets, there was nothing for the public, and yes, people coming out, and they loved it, they came out in freezing cold weather to watch people and laid out, you know, I mean, it's interesting, and I, and I, and I wonder for these theater companies, like, I see a, a hunger for theater companies, established theater, theater companies to grow their audience, to do more work, and yet I don't No, and that was, there was a big separation in the research about that when the, um, they asked the theaters to define the best audience for new plays, mm -hmm. and it was audiences, they were kind of describing, I think a lot of them were describing their own audience, but they were regular theater goers, frequent attenders, well-educated, upper income, and they asked the playwrights, who's the right, you know, who do you think are the best folks to see new or risky stuff, and it was young, yeah. Middle income, not necessarily ongoing theater goers. So again, you know, those are new folks. How do you, how do we balance exactly that problem? Yeah. Well, I mean, one issue is that you were describing new plays as a genre, okay. as opposed to a wide selection of genres within a medium, which is a problem that most people outside of theater already think about theater. They think of theater as a genre, and not a medium. They have a mental idea of what theater is. New plays, I mean. A new play that's going to happen at, you know, a kitchen sink drama is going to be completely different yeah. in every single way to a new play that's going to happen as a giant science fiction, as a fantasy. Right. There's not much risk in that first one. 
Well, there might be. It depends. It's the, are, the if you're doing something for somebody, you have to inherently not be doing something for somebody else. And it's about owning who you're making work for and who you're, what work you're making yourself and being comfortable with the fact that if you're really hitting something out of the park in a specific stylistic way, there's probably a lot of people that aren't into it. And rather than try and get more of those people who aren't into it, find the people who are into the sort of things you're into but just might not be aware that theater is an experience that they enjoy. I'd rather not go after the theater people who aren't interested in what we do, and I'd rather find people like indie music and comic books. Because chances are they just haven't had that experience yet, but we're playing to their content. So in that respect, for us, kitchen sink drama is a terrible risk because that's not what our audience wants. We're our fans. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that you had in the article was the discussion of risk itself mm -hmm. and how it's a perspective mm -hmm. that the kitchen sink drama is just as much a risk to okay. someone as the mm -hmm. sci-fi adventure or whatever. Um, is a risk. So everything is risky in some way, shape, or form. What seems to be pinpointed is the targeting, which doesn't always uh, connect both by from the artist and the institution together. They may have two different perspectives on where that targeting is actually happening. And that's actually what's happening in uh, a lot of other, like YouTube and video and film, is that they're target focusing their marketing, their audience more, which is what a lot of these leaders are trying to do, like Flying B and the smaller ones. Like Rorschach is target focusing its audience base by saying, we're doing this play with this playwright. Let's talk to them about what themes are and how this works. Let's target audiences that will be interested and connect to those things, which was what was in the paper as well, is that the connection to an idea or the connection to a theme or the connection to a playwright or the connection to a title is what's bringing in more and more of the audiences. But the disconnect is happening between what's perceived by the artist and what's perceived by the institution, and that seems to be Talk about that a little more. Well, it's what was in the paper. Right. That the, um, the surveys that you had had right. a disconnect between where they thought the marketing department was doing, what the, marketing right. department, the artist thought the marketing department was doing, versus the artist right. or the, the institution itself. So it seems that there's a disconnect in the discussion of who's doing what and where and bringing all those people together earlier on seems to be where we are right now, but it takes more time, more energy, more effort, more funds. It's a longer process that we're talking about. It, it yeah. gets to this tension that we talked about this morning and that you reflected uh, in our intro comments. If, if a cultural institution has a congregation, then its job is to choose the stories that, that, that for that congregation. But we as artists, I, I have a story, and I want you to find the audience for that story, not for you. So there's sort of this inherent tension built in. And I, don't, I don't know that there's an easy resolution there, but if you came up for us in, in several different ways. I have to say, super quickly, as a person who's you know, at an institution, but part of what you do when you're curating a season is pick stories that you are passionate yes. about that you believe will resonate with your <coughs> sustained audience that is part of your hopes with a particular, with a, you know, also may have um, interest to other people as well. So there also needs to be some thoughtfulness and honesty between the artist and the audience in order to not explode. It's, it's not to not to again not to be pejorative and say that it's not your it's not that you're, that you're doing it wrong that you should yeah. be doing you know it's just there's a tension. I'm just sharing responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I just want to pull out the thread that uh, that I, what came up earlier and I think I think is still running through this and forgive me if I'm stating the obvious but I'm going to anyway, um, which is that. When we talk about risk and its association to new plays and audiences, particularly for larger or mid-sized institutions, a part of what we're talking about is just the difference between known and unknown quantities. Mm -hmm. And the fact that really the reason larger institutions struggle with the moment of presenting a new play to an audience is because their audiences just don't know what that story, Gwydion, that you want to tell is. And I think you're so right yeah. that how you get that marketing, and Karen's story gets to this, how you get the marketing, and if you change marketing into the connecting, the connection to the audience happening earlier so that when they walk in, it's the, the unknowns are diminished. Yeah. It's, I'm sorry. There and then, uh, I was just gonna um, jump on what Michael said and what Woody said. Um, I can't remember how long ago, but there was a conference, the TCG conference in Denver, it was the first time that 
which had to be 10 years ago, where they started, started talking about audience engagement. And that was sort of a new thing. And to me, that sort of went along with the idea of the way technology was evolving, and that pretty soon, there weren't going to be a need for plays, because everybody's going to listen to their phone and their iPad and, their, and make their own movies, right? So, so to me, I, at that point, I was terrified, because I thought, well, that we have no reason to exist anymore, <coughs> because nobody wants to listen to our stories as an institution or an artist. They want to tell their own stories. And so I'm very interested that, you know, when I read that paper and I see that risk aversion is less when audiences are more engaged, mm -hmm. which means they want to tell their own stories. So it is our job to sort of figure out what stories they want to, they want to hear and how, how do those intersect with the stories that you want to tell. Um, and that's really, really hard, but it's a challenge, and I think that's our just to, just to jump on to both of those thoughts, the reason movie trailers are so long, <laughs> like when you finish watching a movie trailer, you feel like you've seen the entire film, it is because the producers know that you will not come unless you feel like you know what you're going to expect. That's why all the best jokes are in the trailers, that's why all the best moments are in the trailers, so that you feel safe enough to buy a ticket. I don't know how to do that for theater, but that's why we do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Over here. <laughs> yeah, I was going to offer to get a point. Um, so the National Music Network has, has these uh, conversations with artistic directors, um, and it's, many of our theaters don't do exclusively new work, but in one of our recent conversations, it was artistic directors talking about what the difference is between marketing new work versus non-new work. Um, and there were a dozen theaters, all of whom do almost exclusively, they do like three-fourths new work, and they said that there was absolutely no difference their mind because what they branded for their audience is that you come in and you may hate it, but that their audience would come back again. I think Wooly is successful at this, I think Florida Minneapolis, mm -hmm. whether you guys can work with. Um, and the idea that, that it's not an isolated experience, that one play doesn't make or break an audience member, that they're, with their season, curating a journey for the audience and through 10 seasons, curating sort of deeper engagement with their audience along the way. Um, that's not, which isn't to say that doing new work isn't risky, because I think it certainly is, and the, the papers um, talk a lot about that, but that it's, it's a different perspective on how to market new work. One of the observations, piggybacking off of that, one of the observations that came up this morning from the paper was that someone thought that, um, that Alan's work seemed to, seemed to imply that there was sort of like, uh, you know, the audience was sort of this, this set thing. <laughs> And that the, the goal was, with his findings, to sort of incrementally move it along the, the, the path. And, and so that was sort of one way of thinking, thinking about it, you know, that, that thing of like that proximate learning and that you would, you would present something that was just almost out of their reach, but then they could grasp it and they could go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe if you were an artistic director and you wanted to do this play, you got to think, mm, maybe it's going to take me five years before I can get my audience to a place that they can grasp it, right? And then someone else is saying, yeah, but where does that, or do you, do you find for each play a, that audience for which, or a show, or whatever, devised work, that is, for that specific group of people, it's that sweet spot of just beyond their reach, right? And so it's not a monolith, monolithic thing of group, you know, moving this, these 1,000 people along this, maybe it's that, but maybe it's finding a different 1,000 people at a different place. And, what is that? And that's that's an interesting sort of either balance or tension. I um, I, I want to first think, say that it's interesting to me that when we at, I'm at Theater J and, and we've gotten this response about doing uh, a long play as that's a risky endeavor for a Jewish theater to produce an Asian American writer. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting to me because he's the the most known playwright we're producing this year, and and almost in two years. You know, we did a man of play last year. Those two writers are the only vaguely, I mean, household names that we produced, um, and yet people are still saying that's risky. Uh -huh. um, I mean, this idea of, we found that we are finding ways to be successful to bring in more diverse audiences, and for all the reasons that, that Karen has spoken about, uh, last year doing plays that examine race, primarily uh, African-American themed, this year it's Asian-American, um, and, and to the, the, I guess the biggest risk was that we would do these plays and play to an audience of 
of older white Jewish people, which which is not only our audience, but our typical audience. <laughs> <laughs> the audience of most of you know, in this city. Uh, and, and that was pretty disheartening, that, that vision. Fortunately, it hasn't been And how did it not happen? Well, uh, I mean, I think Sujin spoke to some of the, the outreach we've been trying to do. Certainly the past, and the uh, both, both last year with uh, doing a play that, you know, 75% of the cast was African American and, 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 you know, with a black playwright and a lot of conversations about how to do outreach into a community that we've always been trying to do outreach to and had varying degrees of success. Um, and, and this year, you know, really publications, Asian American publications that I didn't know anything about, but have been extremely responsive and very eager to, again, to see themselves on stage to, to see questions that they're very interested in dealt with on stage. Um, I think the long-term question will be whether these audiences continue coming well, back. Well, and the other question I have to Karen's point is, what are you getting pushback from, I mean, how's the, how's the house doing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you mean the, the your our ongoing long-term, yeah, your typical supporters. Our, our, our typical audiences actually are, are you know, they're, they're really into identity questions. Right. So, so, so they see it right. as part of a continuum. They don't see it as like, why are you doing a play about a Chinese Filipino American? Filipino American? They see it as, oh, this is. I mean, for the most part, they see it right. as this is interesting in our context. Did they get there on their own, or did you help them? Uh, they, they're, they're pretty much there on their own. I mean, they're they're a pretty um, socially engaged <laughs> audience for the most part. Yeah, to take it back, but what I think they're doing is so great. At. One is I think Ari has. I think he's just generally a great artistic director who's always sort of pushing. I think the conversation. Audience. Lots of great talk back, which is something that, was, that, that the article um, highlighted is really important. We also did a lot of the games beforehand. We talked about games and talked about the beforehand and what's going to be told. Um, you know, I noticed that Joel did like a trailer, a video trailer of the show. I was like, wow, this is starting. I mean, they're, they're thinking. They're thinking. And these are not, I mean, a lot of companies do that. These are not like new. No, but the audience is trying to say this thing. We're doing really a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Ari is, is working to. Kind of prepare and stretch his his subscriber base that they're willing to take on the work that that article also talks about. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's he's very very smart about it. Um, and can I and kind of going back to the audience feedback thing, the audience talk back. I like to just say it's funny that you hate the term audience and like the term fan. I hate the term fan. <laughs> I hate that especially because I like the dialogue, not only between the artist and the institution, but like also from the audience. I want to hear back from. So I love talkbacks because I like to just sit in the back and hear what people are saying. I wonder that we're having some sort of effect on the audience. I mean, what is it working? What's not working? Although well, I love my theater day audience because they're critical. You know, there's you know, there's a, a dialogue, and I feel like the fans <coughs> of adulation is one thing. I think as theater artists, we want to not change it. We also want to be changed. I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be that might be a subject because when I think of fan, I actually don't think of that. I think of people on the internet having conversations constantly on message boards and people who think of what they do as a hobby, not as something that they just do on Tuesday nights. We're talking about the idea of like play going as much of a focus of our hobbyist mentality as play making and having publications online that are geared less towards professionals and more towards fans and people that want to engage in commentary about that and finding ways for it to actually create a fan community. Because I think in this room, we know a number of individual audience members, but there's probably maybe only 20, or like two, three hands, actual like theater fans in DC, people who like talk it up to their friends, bring tons of people, want to talk about it all the time, want to blog about it. We don't really have an outlet to build more of those people right now. We have a lot of sites that give a lot of positive reviews to everybody, but we don't have like a you know, blog. Like a chat room? Yeah, we don't have a place for- We like, one of those in New York, it's horrible. But, yeah, <laughs> and it's like they're the worst place in the world in some respect, but they're where people go to, yeah. to, to build a community of people who just like going to see work together and talking about it. I never want to step foot in a wrestling chat room at all, but I'm glad they exist for people who watch wrestling because they have it. And we don't have that. We <laughs> have in the summer when the tent is pretty Yes, cool. yeah. that's exactly what we have. For those of us who don't know what that is, can you explain what the, it is? The, well, they're here. But the, um, <coughs> there's a tent with a bar in it, and during the French Festival, people can go and between shows and hang out and talk about theater. And I think that's something that we are missing in the scene. I, I mean, I, I, I like the idea of fans too. I think we have to be careful about generalizing yeah. the theater into one experience because yeah. no other 
forum does that. You know, like like I can say I like music, but if you really get down to it, I like about three different styles of music very much, and another three kind of, and there's three that I won't even I would never consider going to see a country music show. I'm glad it exists, but I won't go. You know, so like when we talk about theater as oh, do you support the theater? It just seems like we've created a thing that doesn't actually exist. There are theaters like Jason's. There are theaters like ours. There are theaters like Studio. Um, and we may not have the same audience. That's cool. That's fine. You know. Um, but I think having a space where people can hang out is very important. And I think the tent contributes to that. Most of the time, when I go see a band, I get to have drinks after the show and talk to my friends and talk about other shows that are coming up. You know. That's great. When I go to the theater, when the curtain comes down, I am shoved out the door as quickly as possible. <laughs> Um, and I would like to hang out. I would like to chat, you know. So. Well, and that was one of those things that shows up in the research. It doesn't mean that it have to be just after the show. People want to talk. Yeah. They're happy to talk later. There was over here, and then there, and then there. Yeah, I was just going to um, say, um, just, just the same example which you asked about a while ago. Um, when I was working with here at Wooly, we were doing the I Grew as Eclipse, which was at the library of North Camp. And just one example, I mean, there was a documentary that was about the experiences of these women that was out screenings at a, a, a local movie theater and also here and just to try to present a different experience whether and I think I, I think any organization that I've worked with that I reached out to that was not used to sort of promoting something theatrical was very excited whether it was an email list for a particular community or a spoken word event or a concert venue or movie theater we're excited to sort of add that into the mix to share with their audience especially if we can reach out to the community that we're sort of served and it worked well to sort of just open another door in that wasn't about um, the stuff that works, the you know the press hits and the interviews with the playwright and the talkbacks and the, the you know pre show backs or panels. Those are all good and they still do work really well. But there's other outlets, you know, wine tasting, whatever it is, trivia night, some other way to sort of bring in familiarity function but connect it to what you're doing to sort of open the open the thing up to a different audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so in, in going off of this, um, we talked earlier about the, the idea of the center and the artist at the center, the audience at the center, and this idea of hanging out, you know, this, this tent thing, which is great. Um, I'm, in addition to being at center stage, I'm also a freelance dramaturg. Uh, and over the summer, I went to Mexico City uh, for a collaboration. And something that was really interesting that I noticed was most of the theater, uh, like storefronts or even the big theaters, had restaurants that were attached to them. Um, and so the, this idea of the lobby, I mean, the architecture in Latin America is just very different to begin with. Um, but there were always actors, directors, and then just random, whether they're audience members or just people off of the street that wanted a coffee, there were always people in the lobby uh, because it was also the restaurant. Uh, and so there, this idea of the talk back, uh, I guess, is more exciting when it's talk with. Not, not audience talking back to you. Like you're just, now it's your turn to listen to what they think or for them to listen to you explain what they just saw. Exactly. Um, so, so rather than a formal setting, right, is, is this idea of an open lobby being an informal setting but housed within the formal institution. Um, so problematizing that idea of the talk back and then going more with a dialogue that is really truly um, artists and audience at the center and being able to hang out at any time of the day or night. Uh, I thought it was really interesting when I went to Mexico. It's one of the, the first things that I noticed. Um, I, boy, these are all things to really chew on. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm thinking about the practice of which I've been a part of many times and which we talked about here, which is we have this certain play Let's find a certain audience to come to this certain place so they can see themselves on stage. But have we developed um, some side effects that are negative in doing that? Because what we're doing is siloing things when actually, and on top, it's probably this risk averse and risk tolerance or risk seeking. But have we? gone so far down that path because we, we get that idea that people want to see themselves and reflect on that, that it has become, we've siloed things. So what about seeing this play and going to the audience that, has not, that knows nothing about this experience that may be on the stage and 
it being an eye opening and marketing it in that way. Just finding some, because I just see the conversations, right? It's happened many times in CCG. It's like, what's the African American play in the series? Well, let's find the African American churches and let's go, and, and all of that is valid, but are we, then the conversation is, do, is that going to be our practice and why can't we blend ourselves and our seasons a bit better to have conversations just with interesting audiences that aren't coming in and figure out a way to communicate to a very specific um, uh, audience, you know, if it's an age situation. Like, if we want the 30-year-olds to come to, a, to the gin game, I'm just picking something random. Like, is there a conversation that we can have to show that not seeing yourself is the way, that, the, that that's what theater's about? Am I making any sense? I think yeah. if the last 100 years, if, if we had a different 100 years prior history, then maybe. But I think we're, we are inevitably making up for some, uh, you know, a, a, a pretty shitty history. Oh, absolutely. And I'd love for, I, I don't know, if, I'd love for someone else to speak to that, because um, I don't even think I'm the person to speak to that, but I, I think that's a little bit of a, a, dis, a, a that's a reductive, uh, to me, what, that idea. Well, there's, I, I there's the, in, in one, two, three, okay, I'm sorry. My you mother, agree. My mother always said, don't uh, point, so it's horrible. Okay. <laughs> I do the fringe, so I don't. We don't have this regional theater or specific play thing that sort of a lot of the discussion is about. But one of the things that I do with our budget and with how we talk about programs and how we talk about our mission is that the artists and the audiences are on the same level, and that we have services for the artists and the audiences, and there really isn't a difference between the two. And in that, I think sets up environments where they are able to come together and actually talk to each other as like-minded like people that are seeking like-minded things instead of having this sort of barrier. And then, I mean, I would say 100% of what we market is risk. That we tell you that you're going to come and you're going to see something really horrible. <laughs> or you're going to see something really great. And both are okay, but if you're not able to like gamble, then you're just like, then don't come. Then don't come. Right. Uh, and I think one of the things that's hard about doing that in DC is we have gotten a fan base or a large following or a lot of audience members as we've been going through this the last, going into the ninth year. And what do those people do outside of the festival? And how, how do other like-minded events or like-minded companies, whether it be music, dance, whatever, like how do we, how do we keep it going? So that's sort of yeah, if I could sort of jump back even to what Shirley was saying, that you know, I think there's a big difference between you sort of reference the the February African American play slot um, or that issue, but I think there are entry points into the spirit of the theater that's very different than pandering. I mean, an audience member can smell pander from miles away, um, and so you know, I think just given my experience with forum theater and to jump into the story which Shirley's even talking about with Yellowface that. You know, of the, of the last four shows we've produced, the most common response that resonates with me is so many people saying, I never thought I'd see my story on stage. Both with Clementine in the Lower Nine, which sort of dealt with low-income families struggling, uh, the Tea Party this summer, which was about uh, stories from DC's transgender community, Agnes on the Big Top about mm -hmm. immigration, and this current show, uh, the last show we just did with Nina's Dream, um, that that was always the common response, and then was also added to you know, we would see those people come back. I mean, those people really stood out to me, and we would see them come back because I think what was happening is that we've created a spirit of, of welcoming and an opening of a, of, of a diverse group of audience members so that it's not about we're just working for the show and then we want to bring you in and we're done with you, but that it's a spirit of bringing those different people together, which I think is a very different dynamic than that this show is about this group and then we're done with them. Um, and I think, I think what show is right is there is a bit of an opening up because I think those groups are people who may not be normally going to the theater and they need that entry point to say, oh, this is a theater and these are groups of artists who are interested in my story and engaging with me. And there's that, do you know any specific follow-up to encourage you know, the recidivism rate? 
or um, are people just coming back because going to the theater going to the <laughs> 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 I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I, that kind of is something to see. I assume we all know that also, you know, format also has the do what you can. Um, the, the new new board are to lower the like price point as a barrier. But have you done any like? Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it, Return and that's been this, our past two shows, we started this program called Forum for All, and a major component of that is that most of our tickets are available at pay week one, so trying to eliminate economic barriers, which we know is such a big thing, I mean, even before that, our tickets were $25, but for a family of four and five, that's a big deal, um, and so I think that was, that was the, so working backwards, that was the system of what are the different things that we can do to make everything within the theater accessible so that we can at least eliminate those ideas. We know that it's not this, and we know that it's not this. Um, and I think that does help with that retention rate because, I mean, we, you know, the different levels of spectrum of risk that we're sort of hitting on, one of those is economics, one of those is ticket price. Right. And taking that out of the equation has changed quite a bit for, you know, going to see a, sh you know, we, we were talking over lunch about this idea of everyone keeps talking about the standing ovation on Broadway and people are compelled to stand because, well, we just paid $200, so we better damn well like it. We need to like that. Um, it's really lonely when you're the only person not standing. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so, if we, you know, taking that out of the equation, people can say, I'll go see something that might not work, but I'm much more likely to see it and not have to make the investment part of the equation. I, I, Michael covered a lot of what I was going to say, but um, I also wanted to respond to Samantha's comments. This is kind of fun because these are my two bosses in my, <laughs> um, in my small theater and big theater <laughs> um, But I, I think that part of what we should be striving for in reaching out to diverse audiences and reaching out to multiple people whose stories are on the stage is both the by telling this specific story, we are telling a universal story that anyone else can have an entry point into, um, as well as the, and now you get to see yourself on a stage. And if I think if you're curating your season in a responsible manner, then you're providing opportunities for both. And you're saying, here's one person's story, or here's one entryway into talking about this issue or this type of story, and then here are four other stories that are specific to this individual or this time period, and you are welcome into all of them, and your voice is an important part of how we discuss them and how we process them. One of the things I don't believe in Zani's research, and I'm curious about the rest of you, this came up in the last round of stuff, is when we asked, she asked, we asked the theaters, when you are programming the season, do you think about the audience? And the majority of them said no. <laughs> and I don't know whether that means, does that ring true to all of you? Yeah? Uh, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, being in a very small company, I find that we don't market or, or, or we don't choose the shows and truly it, it, it affects the marketing of the show. We don't market the shows uh, as, let me take that back. I, f I find the, where we get our most success is people attaching to the company itself, the group of artists, as opposed to the individual shows. That people come to our shows and they say, we came because we know that this group is doing this work and it doesn't necessarily matter whether we are doing a jazz show or a ballet, the content of the shows isn't as important to our audiences as the fact that we, as a group, are the ones who are making it. And I don't know how that translates into the bigger institution model, because certainly, the how can you how can you brand yourself as a company if you're not taking into consideration the work that you're doing? But I think that there's something intriguing in that the work that you choose to do isn't always the um, isn't always the indicator of how the audience is going to think of your company. That like people think of our company because of our our particular style. We do puppetry, um, and so people associate uh, a particular style of performance, a particular style of theater, as opposed to uh, a 
content of shows. We're doing a show about this uh, this particular type of audience. Does that make so sense? Someone says to their friend, you want to come see them, they're much more likely to say, oh, this is a theater that does puppetry, not this is a show about. Exactly. Right. That, um, that I find it really interesting that a lot of our audiences, uh, and we don't even really know exactly what the shows are going to be because we're always um, devising them, we're always creating them as a group, so oftentimes we have trouble marketing shows that we don't know how to sell it, so instead we sell ourselves. We say, come see the work that we as artists are going to create, and um, as opposed to come see the story about X, you know? Yeah, I think two terms arose for me in um, hearing that comment. Uh, and one has to do with status quo, and I feel like the other has to do with uh, maybe privilege. And as much as if, if we say that we don't think about the audience, perhaps we're saying we're comfortable with the audience that we've got. So therefore, I don't have to think about anything. I already have an audience. They come, they pay, they buy tickets. So then why must I think about that? And so then there's something to me that registers a little bit about status quo. So then I also think about um, how privilege sort of plays into that. And for some reason, this, of course, also leads to conversations about race and things like that, right? And as much as, um, and, but that's an aside. So I think I want to throw that into the conversation as well. Right, and, it, and it's interesting because the first, the first time I thought about they don't think about their audience, there's a part of me that thought, well, that's really good because it's the artistic, I mean, the, the artist, the person writing it should figure out the place. And then I thought, no, that's not good because they should be thinking, right? And I'm completely torn about this one. Right? Should you? So it's, anyway. I mean, these are two, I have two thoughts about it. One is, it strikes me as something aspirational, mm -hmm. um, not, I think that's so smart. I mean, I think what you just said is like so dead on in so many ways, but I think there's a kind of pre-recession dream that we once lived in, which was that we could just do what we wanted. Um, and I think it's, And that becomes self-perpetuating if you're, right? Right. If you're, yeah. And I think it's, 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 right. Yeah. Right. Um, but I also would say that certainly, uh, speaking as someone who works in a larger institution, we absolutely think about our audiences. We just don't always know what to think. You know, we just don't always, we talk about audiences instead of an audience, uh, and we try to talk, we, we try to predict, and yet we know that we cannot predict their reaction, and they constantly surprise us, and so that's exciting and terrifying and wonderful and really horrible. There's yeah. a handle for that. Oh, yeah. We certainly think about our audience um, with the plays we choose, but one of the things I've been thinking about all through the conversation is that, you know, artists and institutions are not monoliths, and we have artists um, <coughs> like Karen who would come in and say, like, this is the, here's the thing you need to do, which is sort of the dream. Um, and then there are artists who don't care and say they don't care um, who their audience is. They say, that's your job. Um, and then there's audiences who say, we want everyone to come see the play, which as a marketing director is, you know, a whole different kind of challenge. So I guess I'm, the thing that strikes me is how do we build up the sort of trust level or the conversation between artists and marketing departments or, you know, institutions as a whole, where you can say, okay, can you sort of trust my expertise to know my area, and I will trust your expertise to know who you're, you know, who you're telling your story to, and sort of build a conversation around that. That's a really powerful yeah. question. The way you just said that, I love that. Did you trust my expertise to know my area, and I trust your expertise to know who you're telling the story for, and that those are not. Am I getting that right? I think so. Some of the things we talked about this morning was bringing artists into the institution in different ways than they've been brought in. And um, somebody this morning talked about just throwing a chunk of money at the playwright to say, to say, playwright, will you spend four or five hours over the course of the marketing campaign uh, collaborating with our marketing department? Personally, as an artist, I would love that. Mm -hmm. You know, sign me up tomorrow. Because I, I'm, I'm passionate about my story, I'm a great interlocutor for my story, and I want to help you. Of course, you're the expert in your audience, you're also the marketing expert. Now, I'm an expert in my story, and those two expertises are how we uh, build a community rather than an audience. I don't like the word fan, I don't like the word audience, I like the word community. 
Gathering for the community around the story and a conversation about <coughs> that community around the story. And that community can be members of the, you know, you know, aligned by, you know, we're talking about defining an audience by whether they're going to see themselves on stage or not. And I think um, there are certain <coughs> obvious demographic things we can look at uh, when, we're, when we're defining audience that way. But we can also think about psychographics as well. Mm -hmm. Right? These are the kind of people who like this kind of experience, or the kind of people who like this kind of subject matter, or the kind, you know, so I think I would love to be closer to the marketing endeavors that are supporting my work. You know. No, there's no, there's no hand over here. <laughs> so now he's returned. All right, thank you. I've talked for a long time. <laughs> Just to make up for that. Um, I'm stepping back a little bit in, in what the conversation has been, however, and and thinking that one of the things that we, we I don't know that we always take into consideration is where we came from. Mm -hmm. Where did the American theater as it, we know it now in the 21st century, where did that come from? And how did that evolve? <coughs> and are we still able to stand on the ground that was the, where the foundations of our art form of the American theater came from, and even going back to the European theater traditions that we borrowed from, can we still stand on that and say, this is a valid thing that we're doing? When we can look at everything that's gone on in the world since then and see this is not the same. This is not the same moment as Moliere. You know, or Shakespeare, or you know, point to any any of the the ancients that you know whose forms we admire and we continue to replicate or try to replicate. And um, one of the primary things I think that is that stays with us. That, well, it's kind of like evolution in a way. We, we, you know, that that when human beings stood up. And it seems like we thought that everywhere we pissed belonged to us. And from then on, anybody else who wanted to cross that territory had to pay homage to us because we peed there first. And instead of, well, no, <laughs> you know, who cares? That other things happen in the meantime. And how do we evolve? How does this art form evolve? How does the delivery system of the art that we love evolve and not how do we keep it the same as it has been. Um, and I think that's what the efforts tend to look like. All of the, even the things that we're describing, and for the most part, not every single one, that we're trying to figure out how do we go back to that initial model, you know, Zelda and Arena, and how do we recreate that in a 21st century kind of context, you know, and the, 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 another image that comes to me about it is that it's like when, when you confront a body of water, the first, you know, you try to figure out how you're going to cross the body of water, and then maybe there's a, you say, okay, we'll build a boat. And we row, and everybody rows, and everybody helps get across the boat. Then if you more and more people want to cross, so you build bigger boats, and you build bigger boats, until you've got the fucking Titanic, and which is so big and unwieldy that it cannot maneuver when faced with issues. With face with a changing sea, and then you know, and then what do we do? Who do we? We can't. Who do we blame? It's not the ocean's fault. It's the. It's our. It's our nearsightedness. It's our narrow-mindedness. It's our reluctance to let go of previous models and say, well, maybe that just doesn't work anymore, and come up with something new. We've got all, you know, there's hundreds of MFA. People flooding out of colleges all over the country who have no place to work, and yet they feel that they are entitled to work because they were sold on this model that you get an MFA and you, be, you become a professional and whatever design or, or whatever whatever the thing is. You know, same in poetry and, and writing is they feel like they're entitled to have a book published because they got an MFA. But what are we, what are we doing? What are we doing? You know, we, we could. It's like we we. we I don't know. I feel like we've got a water balloon somehow, and we keep we just keep putting chewing gum on the on the on the, <laughs> when the little holes pop and say, "Oh no, we'll try it this way." Instead of saying, "What if we rethought 
And some young companies, I know there are, you know, there are things like the Fringe and, and other companies that are doing this where they're, they don't, they're not necessarily beginning their work thinking that they're going to last forever. You know, they may, maybe they're only going to last while they do these two shows that they're passionate about. This, the, the welders model is a very fascinating model to me too. And you know, they're not the first ones to do this where they, you know, five writers are going to do five plays. And that's it. You know, instead of that we are, that we have to build something that's going to last forever. Because we don't last forever. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I get a little annoyed sometimes with the, the, the sense of, of intended permanence that is implied in the conversations we have about what we're doing with theater. Theater? How is theater even still relevant? I mean, you can watch something on your phone, you know, and every, be in a room with 30 people and everybody be looking at something different. And, you know, and I'm a theater person. I'm not saying that I don't like theater. But, I, you know, I just I feel like we have, we, that's why I don't, I just stop coming to things like this because I feel like we just keep well, rehashing and what? rehashing the same things and, we, and what we're doing is, is spinning wheels and staying in the same place. Part of what I part just to, part of what was useful earlier when and I think it, just a couple of folks from small theaters said why are we here and what was clear is the reason they're here is they have approaches and methodologies that are what some of the other folks want to hear and learn and do from and that's for me anyway that's I mean for us that's part of what this is about is that it, it's got to move in this direction because. I think if you drill down on the research, I think if you drill down on the, the sustainable audience versus the specific audience, you're coming to a place where the new sustainable audience is going to be a totally different kind of audience than the audience it was. And, I and it's time to say that's what's happened. And I would even say, why are we talking about a sustainable audience? Why, you know, why aren't we thinking that audience is the audience that it is for each? To me, that's sustainable. Huh? Like we're, this is vocabulary. I'm saying. Okay. Like, the same, a different audience 20 times is a different it's version a different, of sustainability. It's a different, okay. That's yeah, what so I'm saying. It's a whole different concept yeah. than, than, you know, than what we generally think of. And I've worked in a tiny, tiny theater and the biggest theater in town. I'm one of the biggest theaters in town. And, and the conversation, we have had the same conversations for 40 years. Okay. Oh, there's a hand. Oh, way over there. Yeah. 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 Um, so one of the things that I, I think is very interesting that you brought up about this delivery process. We're talking a lot about the, the message and what the message is, but I haven't, and I realize I'm late, I'm very sorry about that, but, um, I, but I'm also wondering what, how we're delivering things. So, so I think there's, it's one thing to be welcoming and to um, open your doors up and say come in, but I think it's another thing to go outside of your doors and go and have a presence in the neighborhood that you live and work in. And it's another thing to, you know, say, um, we want you to come and see our theater, um, but then to say that instead of sending it through an email, um, knocking on people's doors, that's something that's old, that's, you know, and what makes theater special is that it is live and in person, and it's, you know, I understand the feeling that we need to compete with the internet, but but that's not what theater is. That's not the point. So why would we try to become that when what we have is actual live people? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I was just getting excited about some things that Jennifer said, particularly when she uh, invited us to go back to the um, origin of these sort of models, right? With the regional theater comes from, and I was thinking about the emergence of the subscription model in the um, late 19th and early 20th century. It actually arose sort of in response to, you know, various uh, censorship and things of that nature, and it became a way for companies to do challenging work because there wasn't a medium where work could get done, right? So you form a private club and you fund this thing so that we can do work that was challenging or provocative or that no one else would pay for and you wouldn't lose your shirt, right? And you can kind of keep doing it. So it's interesting that we start with a subscription audience in order you know, to have this private club so that we can do the craziest thing possible. We can break all the rules. We can be wacky, and it's okay. And somehow that has grown to the point where now it's, it's safety, 
And we no longer are interested really in breaking the rules. We just want to maybe keep getting bigger and bigger. I don't know, but it's just interesting mm -hmm. to sort of think about where we started versus where we are. Yeah. And yeah. that's the question, is like, what's the notion of success? Mm -hmm. right. Like, what's your definition of a successful theater? It is, is it to kind of keep amassing a fortune, or there isn't really much for <laughs> You know, like, do you want to, like, get more people that can pay $50 seats? Do you want to, you know, what's, what's the purpose of why we're doing this? And I also think the question of, like, you mentioned of, like, privilege yeah. and entitlement and who are we inviting, who are we not inviting, who by the nature of the work that we're showing and the cast that we're hiring, are we excluding it from, from the theater to begin with? And I think it's not just a question of that person looks not like you. It's also a question of, is that an experience that I relate to in I any way? And I think that means that maybe people have to give, maybe give up this kind of notion of control mm -hmm. that is this artistic vision Yes, that's great, but like if you're not considering your, I mean, the, if you're not considering your audiences in, in how you're programming, <coughs> then that's a problem. So we, we've got about, we're, we're coming, not, we've got half an hour. So there's a couple things you want to do. First of all, I want to hear from some hands from people we haven't heard from. So I see this hand and here and here. Right, so I want to hear from you three for sure. And then maybe begin to kind of come back to it where you were saying, why are we here? And begin to not close this down, but kind of, Maybe coming in for a little bit of a landing. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm just responding to a couple of a couple of <coughs> things that have been said. I mean, so I'm coming from a, a small theater company that is starting to grow at this moment, and um, we're at a point where we are, you know, we're looking to grow. We're looking to get maybe like 10 to 15 extra audience members in each show. So we're at a point where we can go and knock on doors, and that's something that we're. Doing. We're starting to talk about more about how to grow our audiences, and at this point in time, we're um, we're not necessarily thinking about our audiences as we program. We've been thinking, you know, we, we choose work that we're doing based on what we're excited about doing, and the ways in which we've been starting to talk about how to grow our audiences has more to do with, um, you know, how do we how do we establish loyalty? Like, how how do we make sure that someone from the ensemble is always in the lobby, you know, every night, so that we're having conversations with people. Um, we're thinking about it in terms of growing our community. But I also wonder, you know, if we continue to grow, is that something we're going to be able to continue to do? You know, or you know, is if if we continue, if if, if we turn into a Titanic, is that is, is that going to change? You know. Um, <laughs> yes, so, 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 so it's experience suggests it will. Yeah, yeah. So I think, mean, but I just think it's. Um, it is interesting that there are smaller companies and younger companies and, and more established. We're just we're dealing with different challenges, so it's. Um, yes. You know, it's interesting because I feel like we're we're um, coming at this topic really far downstream in that. Um, if we're talking about community or fans or audience, why why are we as artists not um, in the community to get people where they are and to ask them what the stories they want to tell us? That you know, or if, if, you know, and I understand that we need to go and say, you know, who do we target? How do we get people to come to us? How do we get the, our community to come to us and say we have these stories to tell? We want to engage with you. I mean, I think of Teach for America or the Peace Corps or, you know, something like that. <coughs> artists are part of the community and go out and see, we seed ourselves. Um, I have a friend who's a director who says, you know, um, nobody ever forced anybody to take hockey appreciation classes. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, you know, I come from a working class background. You know, by all accounts, I should, you know, I should not be a theater person. But my parents instilled that in us because to them, it, it was a way of being a good human being. And I think we've lost that by not teaching, you know, not teaching art in the schools. And so I, you know, it's part of the curriculum. You know, I'm not talking about teaching artists who go in. So I wonder if there, you know, I have no answer, but it's just a question. I feel like when we, when we do this, we're coming, we're coming far, we're coming way too late. I think that it, that, that, that it all needs to begin a lot further, a lot earlier in the process. Um, so just to say super, super quickly, there are, of course, tons of people and tons of theater companies. There are 
there are a bunch of bright spots across the country that do um, audience engage, you know, that sort of do co-create with their audience. I know there's a, actually a sort of interesting partnership that's um, just starting now at People's Light outside of Philadelphia. Sorry, yeah, um, commissioning commissioning writers who propose to work with different communities um, in their area. So if you're passionate about that, so I don't. It, none of them have none of the plays have been written yet, but it might be. Barrington Stage is doing that as well. Yeah, and even right. Center Stage with the hot desk yeah. resident playwright uh, in the lobby. Uh, yeah, uh, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm a playwright, and uh, every so often at Center Stage, I'll sit in the lobby before um, the show, and I'm very interested in collecting people's stories. And we have we have this thing called Write Right Now, where I'll talk with um, audience members as they come in for. I don't know, a minute, five minutes, and hear a grain of a story, their story that they're really interested in sharing, and then by intermission or the end of the play, they have their own personalized new play that they you can, you, that I have written for them while they're sitting in the performance. <laughs> wow. it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like a food truck model. What was what? Was yeah. The, what was the? I want to have my dream is this like story. Food trucks, sort of like story core well, well, that I don't have a name for it. No, it was, the, it was the it was like the plays on demand or whatever it was. Play, uh, place to serve to. Damn it, there was a good. It's on the street. Do they know? How, do they know you're there before they get there? No. So, there's a, so we're working on that. Yeah, there, I think there's an email that goes out. It's in those, our newsletter. Yeah, it's in our yeah. newsletter. Because I, I would think otherwise. If, <laughs> goes up and says, I'm going to write a story about, would you like me to tell me something I can write a play about? Well, there's there's also a, a fish bowl. There's some prompts, prompts. and so there's a prompt. but, low risk sometimes. Right. Yeah. The, well, the, the interesting thing is, though, that there's there are prompts, but uh, so often audience <laughs> members are intrigued by the prompts and pick right. one up, but they don't go with the prompt. <laughs> They're like, oh, this is so dumb. I should tell you this instead. Yeah. But I think it's interesting because it speaks exactly to some of that stuff that was in the study about people... What are the characteristics of people who are more, for lack of a better term, risk tolerant? And it's people who are do have things they want to say, and they are so they are motivated. And so this is a way of glomming onto that and saying, "Okay, so you tell me, and I'll yeah." Okay, and then yeah. Well, no, I'm from a company called Baltimore Rock Opera, and um, we are very community centered. Um, we we exist within this. Um, we we have a community, and, and the ideas get generated within the community, and the plays get written within the community, and then the production happens within the community. Kind of extends out and out further and further. Um, we've been doing something called a pitch party for the last few years. It's kind of a difficult idea, but basically, we ask our community what they want us to produce, and. Huh. Uh, we're not in the position that a lot of the companies here are in. We're, we work in very different ways, but I, that's kind of my question to a lot of people here. It's like, why not ask the audiences what you want them to produce as a way of kind of finessing some of those. It, it's very difficult to try to get people in and try to build work with them in that generative kind of process. It's really hard and cumbersome. Why not just ask them what they want you to produce and then produce it? <laughs> some some people are doing that. Yes. You had your head up. Right? Long, long, long. <laughs> Um, I'm interested in this conversation of audience, particularly, Ronnie, something you said at the very beginning of the discussion about the audience that isn't there. Because I work with a puppetry company that in part makes new puppet work for adults. Uh, that is very challenging to market. Uh, and when we ask for advice how to market that, people say, well, puppetry is for kids. What do kids go to the family? Are you two different companies? We're different yeah. companies. Oh, right. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, the so, you know, this is the advice that we get, and the fact is, the, they do come out. The, the kids come, they see the work, they enjoy it. Um, so we're in a situation where we have a group of artists who have made work for their peers and perform it for a group of 10 to 12 year olds. The, the artists are doing the work that they want to do, there's an audience, they're enjoying it, but it doesn't feel like a success. Mm -hmm. Because we're not reaching the people that we've had in mind. Um, and that also made me think of, in, from the paper, the question about marketing. And playwrights thinking that, oh, institutions aren't, aren't as successful as they should be at marketing. Is it butts in the seats, or is it writing, or reaching the audience that the playwright had in mind? Mm -hmm. And is it even okay for the playwright to have that audience in mind? 
know, is it is it wrong to say, well, if the 10-year-olds show up, that's not the right audience. If they're enjoying it, why is that wrong? I mean, look there and then there. Yeah. Well, just um, two things that have been ta talked about today that will say something, um, things that I learned from my wonderful mentor, Joy Zinnemann, um, who created studio theater. One is flattening the triangle um, that you talked about at the outset, that she was always committed to the idea of artist managers, not that every artist has to build the institution and every manager has to be on stage designing, performing. But, although and there were cases where that happened, um, but that managers need to understand the artist and what's going on. And artists shouldn't just be going to the marketing director and saying, find an audience for my play, but should understand enough about marketing that they could speak knowledgeably, not run a marketing program, but be able to work with a marketing manager and inform that person, help them make better choices and help to guide them. Um, second thing, talking about uh, the limits of subscriber audiences and programming to your audience is uh, studio always led. It was the belief of leading by doing the art that the institution wanted to do. And what's interesting is for every time there was a play, the play that got the most outraged letter, letters from subscribers swearing they would never come again and never renew, got even more new subscribers. Mm. So that over time, the theater developed an audience for the art that we wanted to do. Yeah. And then we could do the things we wanted to do, knowing that that's what the audience was coming to see. And they found you. Right. And along with a lot of effort from marketing people to reach out to them. I'm sorry, can I just interrupt for a second? Uh, there was a period in the late 80s, where I was called from studio almost every week for the entire summer. <laughs> it wasn't me. So, no, I'm sure it wasn't you, but, but I'm just saying, like, like this, it's not, it's, 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 and I don't mean to throw this at you, like, it's not like I'm challenging you or whatever, but it wasn't always that idyllic. Like, like they actually aggressively sought an audience right. in the late 80s, and I remember receiving those calls and going, I already go. Like, and what's interesting, it wasn't selling single tickets, it was going to the people, who, to our audience, to our existing audience, and trying to get them to commit to a season. And if they didn't commit, they would at least come to more shows and talk to other people, because it's your core uh, audience, the people who are committed to your work, who are going to then find other people, bring other people in. Did you ever subscribe? No, because I never paid for theater. I, I always came in with a friend or like, I'm like I can't afford anything. Was... I, I just want to say two quick things. Um, to, speaking to the, the audience, adult audience of puppetry, I think you're noticing something that those of us who have been here, you know, 10 to 15 years now, have recognized that we as a community are. are learning to be more open to risk, our audiences as a community. And, and, and that's a big part, I think, because of the Fringe Festival, and I think we're all really glad about that. But we are still um, defining what is a play. It is, has changed substantially in the past five years with the amount of device theater and non-traditional theater. I think, I think they're getting there. I think audiences continue, will continue to get there. Um, because for, for a long time, I think we, we were following a very traditional, this is a play and this is how we do it model in this city, much more so than New York. Um, and, and I just want to say one other small thing. Uh, you guys have been successful in doing something that very rarely happens, which is bringing the Baltimore community into the same room as the DC yeah. community. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, for the yeah. that one out. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, just based on something I said in the morning session is I go out and talk to a lot of people in our community every day as part of my job, shopping and doing various things. And um, and I've learned also with working with Darwin 20 DC and 
slash devising work with audience, um, that there is sort of a bigger institutional among all of us or individuals fear of audience or sort of not giving them the benefit of the doubt for the like, risk and will they accept risk and people within our community and is this work too much for them or too big for them or too, is it going to bore them? Um, and, and then whenever I go out and actually talk to people at a store or at, you know, like I'll say like at the cobbler or at whatever place I go to, they're always like, oh, that, you know, I can say, you know, there's nudity and cursing and, um, and then things blow up and it's crazy and there's no real plot and there's no timeline. And they're like, yeah, I saw something like that back in Russia. I saw something like that in the street guy. I saw something like, that's the kind of theater I used to see all the time with my family. And there's an audience out there who's like, ooh, like in some ways way more progressive and ready for this than we are. Um, and also finding with audience um, participation in developing new works, Everyone's like, audience participation, they get scared if you ask too much or expect too much. And we're finding ways of doing it that where they continually surprise us of how much they're there waiting, like thirsting to participate. And we just have to meet them halfway in many cases. Mm -hmm. They're there, they're waiting for us um, to join them. Um, and so, for, I don't know, like risk and is our, you know, can our audience take the risk? I think, I think they can, it's a matter of whether we can. Mm -hmm. You guys over here. Uh, so uh, there's been a lot of directions that this conversation is going on. So um, uh, I'm trying to focus myself. Uh, touching on the silos and the pandering and the large institutions <laughs> as flexible versus small institutions as flexibility. One of the things that at a conference for content creators of movies and film that was in a couple of years ago had a similar conversation of where's our audience going and what's going on with it. One of the things that they found really successful for them was a large organization that is Ill inflexible, uh, the Titanic, uh, gathering and giving support to a smaller organization that is much more flexible. And we found that at Rorschach, uh, which is one of the companies I'm part of as well, at Atlas, that they have a relationship together. And one of the things <coughs> we're seeing is that audiences are bleeding over between other things that they produce and things that we produce. And you see it at the fringe constantly, is that that conversation that happens at tent is that the audiences start bleeding over from one company to the next company. So as larger as organizations such as like Paramount Pictures puts together a microfilm budget for a small creator like Louis C.K. to make his film, it only has to make X amount of money to be successful, but it brings in a new audience for Paramount to be able to tackle onto. Uh, and we're seeing that as like a great break point, as a lot of things are doing, but we need more of it. Um, a lot of times people talk in different ways about theater being similar to dating, and I don't think that's an accurate <coughs> thing, but um, you can't expect people to know who you are if you don't know who you are. Like, you have to have a very strong sense of self in order to be what somebody wants to spend time with. I mean, it doesn't, mm -hmm. I don't think that's different than organizations. If you know what your values are, and your goals are, and your aesthetics are, and you know whether or not you want to become the next arena, or if you're fine being the equivalent of like a cable network, whatever the thing is, and you know exactly what you're going after. I mean, with Flying V, uh, I created a bullet point of aesthetics from when we started, that every show that we do has to hit some sort of like core critical mass of what's well, on this aesthetic bullet point. I like things that aren't on that aesthetic bullet point, but it wasn't what we in this company were going to do. Hopefully the goal is, and I think it's going to happen, if we stick, that's a big enough thing to have lots of cool stuff to do. It's a small enough thing that if we keep doing it, we know exactly who we are, the people who like what we're doing, they find us. If it turns out that not enough people like what we're doing and that's what we want to do, then we don't do it anymore because we couldn't find the people that we wanted to do it. But we stick with high quality thing that we want to do. Because that's the other thing that I sort of have seen is that the shows that have been the least successful for us tend to be the ones that I look at as an artist and go, uh, that, fuck that up. Uh, and B, I, they don't hit that critical mass. So they're A, not at the level that people want to talk about it and give their recommendation, because that's the really capital. People have high taste and they have a lot of pride in their taste and they go to other people and they say, when I recommend this to you, I really hope you like it, because then I have higher taste and you would describe that. So I'm going to be super careful about what I put on Facebook. I'm going to be super careful about what I recommend to you. Even more careful about what I go to, because I want you to think that I, my recommendation has value. So the work has to be at an exceptional level. 
and it has to be really understood of who you are and what you do so that people can become to begin a relationship with you where they know who you are. You're not pandering. You're not saying who do you want me to be because that's not who I am. And eventually in every relationship, if you find out that someone's black, then you give up. Ellen. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to what Jason said. It's really the first thing you said. Um, and then I have three quick things that I would love to see moving forward. I want to try to wrap things up. Um, what I heard you say in, about fans and what JoJo was saying about the survey that you all did where the theaters who did like 50% new work said there was no difference. What I'm hearing here is a sense of a really strong brand. And you know, I know lots of artists don't like to think of theater as business, but we need to get paid for the work that we do. So if we think of ourselves as a business, all good businesses and corporations, the best ones out there, have really strong brands. And brands aren't just logos, they aren't just colors, it's not just your typeface, it's not just the work you produce or the product that you produce, but it's how you treat your customers as well. So it becomes a complete brand experience. You guys can think of stores like Starbucks, you can think of companies like Target and Amazon and Zappos. Those companies do a really great, and Apple, of course, do a really great job at that. So when I launch a new product, like an iPad, if I'm Apple, I can do that. I don't need to tell you all the great things about what an iPad can do for you. You trust me because you trust my brand. So if you're an organization that produces predominantly new plays or has a really strong brand, like this is where you come to have conversations about social identity. This is a place where you come to do really cool shit in the lobby. Like this is a place you come to like have like a gorgeous building or whatever. Then you can get away with more as long as it's on brand, which in the translation for theater, which is on mission. So I just thought that might be an interesting thing to ponder. Um, and three things that I would love to see sort of moving forward, they're not really bright spots, um, and I hope they don't sound like recommendations, they're just ideas. Um, one is, crap. Um, one <laughs> is the thing that I keep getting cut off from was what Woody and, and uh, Aaron Posner were saying earlier, like, what if you were to find some money to pay a playwright to come in and be a consultant to the marketing staff? Mm -hmm. um, great idea. I would love to add to that idea um, funds for a meal, um, maybe at an off-site location where the two people can leave the actual venue, and for a temporary staff person to pick up the slack of the work that's not being done in the office when that marketing person is gone. Um, not to say that they're doing the director's work, but maybe they're helping out, out on the staff. Um, I think one thing that was brought up earlier in the morning was a lack of time and what can we get rid of from the place of our administrators to allow more time to converse with artists. Um, so there's one simple-ish solution. Um, to be great at funders could uh, find out a way to make that happen. Uh, two is I would love to hear uh, bright spots in marketing. Um, I've heard really cool things come out of conversations with artistic directors, but I would love to hear bright spots moving forward about conversations that playwrights or other <coughs> artists or artistic directors have had with marketing directors um, and how that collaboration has specifically worked well. And I totally said I had a third, and I don't remember the third, <laughs> but I'm gonna remember within the next 10 minutes and I'll raise my hand again. <laughs> so first of all, I wanna thank everyone Florida, how prepped everybody was. Yeah. They were like, wow, they like, read it. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really good, and it's, it's, it's really helpful as we go forward. Um, secondly, this is not the end of the conversation. This is actually the very beginning of, as I said, of six. This is the very beginning of phase one. And one of the things that I've been trying to do as I've been listening is thinking about what we need to know from the audience when we start asking them this summer. Can I come back to the, go ahead and do the third one. It was the one where I said earlier this morning about challenging um, Alan to survey audiences who don't have comments. So, oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm hearing things that we have disagreements amongst ourselves. Did, did you want to put your website? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll remember. Okay. Um, <laughs> that, that we don't know what the relationship is between needing to see your story and what the invitation is and what the church, we're making a set of assumptions in the midst of what's an old, is a fraught conversation for all of us. And so one of the things that would be really interesting would be to actually finally see what folks say about that. And what do I have to, when's my entry point? 
And once they have my entry point, what else, where else am I willing, where else do I want to go? Forget willing, that's a pejorative term. So that's to me is an example of something that I am hearing that I really would like to learn more about if we can talk to the audience. There are other things that we already heard today, and what, but that's when people say, what's this really about? It's this, you know, we know a lot about the two parts of the triangle. We, we know, because we are the theaters and we are the artists, but as someone, we are, we are so not the typical audience because either we don't pay for our ticket or it's our friends or, I mean, it's just, it, you know, or it has to be really, really, frankly, it's got to be really different and good sometimes to even get us excited, right? So we're not the audience, and, that, and a big part of what the impetus for this project is, is let's stop guessing where they fit into this equation. So as you think of stuff, we're going to um, have a little disagreement this morning about our current capacity, but within a week or so, um, at the TDF website is www.tdf.org, and there will be a link that gets you to the magazine that Mark edits, which is Stages, where we will have a place where we are going to continue this conversation. So, and, and that Are you inviting audiences into this time? We're trying to. It's really hard because you have to sit. We're trying to, and we were trying to today, and I didn't, it's how we... It's, so as you have colleagues in other cities, like where we're going, let them know that it really would be okay for them to bring in some of their audience. Because we'd like to get those people in the room even now, because we'd get a different kind of pushback, and we don't know how to do that. So if you have ideas about that, please, either that you can just email us, right? How do we get those people in? It's the daytime, how do you get them to take time off? Or blah, blah, blah. But that would be really helpful, right? So. That's the next piece. This is really the beginning. And the focus, I mean, with both of us, where this comes from, we, we, it's interesting that it's resonating in a lot of conversations a lot of us have had over the years. But, you know, I go to bed and get up in the morning, and I'm supposed to, and I think about, actually, how do I get people to go to the theater? That's the, that's the main thing we do, and our mantra is, it's the birthright of everybody who lives in the city of New York. And that's, I mean, you feel that way in and that's what we do, and that's what this conversation is about. Because it'll make everybody's it'll make everybody's work better. Because you know we aren't the Titanic; we just have to figure something. Anyway, so that's that. That's the next step, yeah. I think, yeah. more than anything else. Yeah, and so do stay in conversation with us, and um, and we are going to San Francisco and Los Angeles and Minneapolis and Chicago and New York. So for your colleagues who live in those cities or nearby those cities. It would be great to you know involve as many people. If you have any ideas about how to find get some audience people in the room in the beginning, that 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 would be really helpful. Yeah. May I ask a question? Sure. So in thinking about um, audiences that are not showing up, or audiences that are not being reached or spoken to, or who traditionally don't have their stories told, yeah. um, how are you going to go into those communities and make sure that you hear I, I, from? My, the my thought is, and I'm just totally. I'm, I'm going to put out a call to everyone who came in these conversations, who's in particular, who's an artist, and say, or any market, and say, who did you go to to find people to bring in? Right? Who, when, when you were doing work to get the people not in the door, not in the room, in the room, where did you go? I mean, but, but if, but if the survey says that most, and again, I don't. Being at a theater company, I, I, I kind of blows my mind to hear that some do not think about their audiences. But if if survey says most don't think about their audiences, then how is going to them and asking that question <coughs> going to? No, I'm not going to ask them. What, oh, I, okay. what I was saying was, if you do, if, if you if, if you're working with community organizers, right? I mean, gotcha. Who are the folks that? So going to the artists the rather than with, the how, do we, how do we get to those groups and? With your endorsement, say you know, fill this out. It would be really interesting, right? It's that it's the same. It's we we need the help of everybody in the room to get outside the room. Sure, great, thank you. And let me just reiterate, you will within the next ten days be receiving another an email from us that tells you how to continue to get in touch with us. We just want to create an environment that allows the conversation to happen 
rather than just giving you like my. We're one of those really big organizations, and we haven't told the IT folks yet that they're going to say something. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's so, that's sorry. Dish. Just, just um, so that we aren't sending useless emails. Why why not have those conversations with audiences after a show? Like, yeah. Why not just yeah. go into a theater and say, "Stick around, audience. We want to talk about." Well, what, what part of what we're going to do is realign some of the funds um, yeah. that we had that were budgeted in this in this project, and we really discovered it from reading Alan's paper. And it was like in, in talking with Alan, we got very excited about this actually, about create, asking him and, and commissioning him to create a protocol to do that. Okay. So that this is a piece that you know this this project is evolving as we go, and that was something really just in the last week that we're like, you know what, we really need to do this. Mm -hmm. We need to create a protocol to really dig in more deeply and with these audiences. So that's that will be something new. That and time and funding being what it is, we may also ask some of you guys if you would do that. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So that you, that's part of the, you know, you meet us, we meet you, and it's like, will you do that at your theater for a month afterwards? So if you've got it, right? So. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, diversity. So the thing that I want to call out to is this, idea of um, the evolution of theater mm -hmm. and how we need to evolve ways that not only that we create theater but meet our, our audiences into theater and also artists. At the same time that this conversation, well for an hour at the same time that this conversation was happening, the race and representation conversation was happening. Mm -hmm. However, I'm so sushi because I'm going to do this. Yeah. I respond oh. to that question. <laughs> and and it's, it's unfortunate that that happened at the exact same time mm -hmm. in the way that it did because it should have been a cross conversation. Mm -hmm. right. So I told all those people, hey, race representation. Get over to triple play. You need to be a part of the conversation. Because the reality that we all have to face, particularly people in the Baltimore, DC area, urban areas, is that in 2050, yeah. we're going to have a minority majority. Right. So the conversation around who is your audience, who are you inviting into your room, has got to look different than it has for the 2,000 plus years that it right. has. Right. And you've got to be able, someone said, to be afraid to have that. You say, I love, I do not know how to talk to you. Right. New people who are entering. This community that I live in, who I want to program for, and we've got to, and this, yeah, lead, 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 lead the art. We, we are experts. We got our MFA. We've been working for 20 years. I'm a player. I know what I'm doing, even necessarily. But you can speak to your experience better than I can and inform, engage. So that's what I wanted to just put out there is that the diversity conversation has been itching its way in here. But if we're talking about growing and sustaining our audiences, we have to have that conversation. Yes. We have to talk about difference. And, and how we're bringing inclusion into that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's four. <laughs> 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 <laughs>